So welcome everybody. Uh, thanks so much for coming. Um, my name is Patricia. I'm the, master, the DC Master Gardener Coordinator. Really happy to see so many of you here and I'm honored that Mike agreed to host this talk for us. Thank you so much for coming, Mike. Mike. Um, sorry, uh, please post any questions you have in the chat box and I'll turn it over to Mike. Ooh. Well, cheers. I'm just having a little uh, glass of water here. Welcome everybody. Thank you so much for uh, inviting me into your homes this evening and uh, I haven't seen any cats yet so uh, turn on your your screens if you like uh, I always like to see a cat or two during the talk um, I'm a professor of entomology at University of Maryland College Park thank you Kathy thank you so much for bringing in what's what's his name or her name Okay, Kathy, you're muted, so I'm going to uh, I'm going to move along. Uh, some of you have probably heard me. Uh, I'm an extension educator. Uh, I work on issues of invasive species, urbanization, and climate change for my research. But my outreach uh, is directed very heavily towards uh, folks like yourself, master gardeners, master naturalists. Uh, I also work very closely with the arboricultural industry trying to help uh, homeowners and businesses find better ways to manage insect pests in more sustainable ways in landscapes. Uh, I do a lot of outreach. I'm sure that some of you have probably heard me on Kojo and other broadcasts of WAMU uh, and may have seen me on uh, network somewhere or in the post. So I, I do a lot of outreach. And this year has been especially wonderful because of the periodical cicadas. Um, when they come about every 17 years, brood 10 here in the DMV, I'm often asked and invited to uh, share some bug stories about these little rascals. And I'm sure that uh, down in the district, right now they're singing up a storm and uh, we're hitting peak. I've had a lot of questions today from the various news agencies. Are we there yet? The answer is yes, we are there. Uh, all of the cicadas pretty much are out of the ground. Uh, the chorusing you hear, the flying around, all the nonsense and shenanigans will continue now for about another two weeks strongly. And then uh, we will begin to see the cicadas taper off. They'll begin to wane a bit. I'm sure you're seeing a lot of cicadas on streets and sidewalks as they give up the ghost. And uh, unfortunately, sadly, uh, basically finish their life above ground uh, here in uh, 2021. So what I'd like to do now is give you a bit of an overview about periodical cicadas, a little bit about their ecology and evolution, why they're here, what they do, and some of the things that make them uh, one of the most fascinating creatures on planet Earth. So with that, off we go. I'm going to do a share screen and we'll take some cicada stories. So. Uh, Patricia or someone, if you would give me a thumbs up, if you can now see a periodical cicada. Okay, very good. We're in business and I want to thank my colleague, uh, Paula Shrewsbury, who you may have seen, uh, who helped put this presentation together. Well, one of the earliest records I could find of periodical cicadas here in Maryland came in 1751. Uh, from an anonymous source who published the following in uh, the Maryland Gazette in April. We are informed in some places, the locusts have been found in great plenty just beneath the surface of the earth, almost at their full growth. May God avert our impending calamities. So you see, our early colonists knew about periodical cicadas. There is no question. This report probably came from St. Mary's County, where we actually have a brood of cicadas. It's uh, brood 19. Uh, it's a 13-year brood of cicadas. Uh, the timing would have been correct for that. And remember now that these were folks that were escaping religious persecution in Europe. They had come to a new world. They had settled in. 
and suddenly there were billions of these creatures coming up from the earth. I bet they said, OMG, we're back in Egypt. It's the eighth biblical plague, the plague of locusts. Well, you're far enough along, I'm sure, in your training to understand that uh, locusts are really grasshoppers. So cicadas, nah, they're not grasshoppers. Cicadas are much more closely related, of course, to aphids. They belong to the order we call hemiptera, the true bugs. And these are sucking insects with incomplete metamorphosis, meaning they have eggs, nymphs, and adults. So quite different than grasshoppers. These guys, of course, have chewing mouth parts. These guys sucking mouth parts. Uh, again, biblical plagues of cicadas, and I often see journalists still calling these things uh, locusts, which is, is strange to me, but the biblical plagues of locusts, not cicadas, basically were devastating. They are become migratory and they basically eat everything in sight. The periodical cicadas, on the other hand, uh, they're quite large insects, but they feed on what we call xylem fluid. I'm not sure if you've had your botany lecture yet, but you may recall that plants basically have vascular systems. Part of the vascular system is called the xylem, which conducts water and nutrients to the canopy of the tree for the purposes of photosynthesis. That's the tissue that the periodical cicadas feed on, the xylem fluid. Uh, they don't really swarm but they do certainly occur in huge numbers. And I think this is part of the reason that folks thought they were part of the biblical plague. Um, their numbers can be enormous. Uh, there are densities that have been recorded as high as about 1.4 or 1.5 million per acre. And in a simple hectare of land, there could be two metric tons of cicada biomass underground. So they're, they really are quite abundant, I think, as we well know this year. We've seen astounding numbers of cicadas. People will say, Mike, well, what's the big deal? Don't we have cicadas every year? And the answer is yes, we do. Every year we have what we call the annual or dog day cicadas. These guys spend anywhere from about two to eight years underground developing. They're going to emerge usually towards the end of June, July, August, and perhaps into September. And their strategy for survival is what I call stealth and speed. So they're very difficult to see in the treetops when they're there. And if you get close to them, they take off like jets. So they're very hard to catch. They're actually very difficult to observe. Periodical cicadas, on the other hand, live their life underground for 13 or 17 years. They appear in mass, as we know, in just tremendous numbers every 13 or 17 years. And uh, they're usually going to begin to appear towards the end of April reaching a peak the last two weeks of May and then into the first week of July before they tail off. Their color patterns, they have bright red eyes, a jet black body and beautiful wings. And they have one of the most bizarre strategies for survival of any creature on the planet. It is called predator satiation. What they do is emerged simultaneously in such massive numbers that they fill the belly of every predator that wants to eat them. And there are still enough left over to perpetuate the three species. Boom, that's crazy. Who does that? Well, cicadas do it and they're very good at it. A lot of people don't realize that it's not one species. There are actually three species of periodical cicadas that are emerging right now in our area. And we can see all three right here in the DMV. The largest of the three, and we can tell them apart by their color patterns, by their size, but perhaps more importantly, by the songs or calls they make, also by habitat preferences and of course, genetic analysis. The largest of the three is the one we call Magi Cicada Septem Decim. Oops. And let's listen to a Septem Decim call. I'll see if I can get this cranked up here a little bit. 
so we can hear it, let's see. And I'm sure you've heard this one, but you may not have known this was septem decimals. Let's listen. That one is also called the pharaoh cicada because it's got the double pitch, the pharaoh, pharaoh, that's the pharaoh cicada. This is my favorite, this noisy little rascal that sounds like an electronic transformer short circuiting, that's Cass and I. And finally, Septemdecula is a little bit more mellow. I like this one. It sounds maybe a little bit more like a Katie did. We can also tell by their color patterns, the ones with the broad yellow or orange bands on the abdomen are the septum decims. The cassinites have a jet black belly and the other guys are somewhere in between. Okay, so this is how we can tell the three species. So your homework, Tomorrow will be to go out and find the three different species of periodical cicadas. Right, Patricia? Yes. We also, we, uh, we also have four species of 13-year cicadas, and they too differ in their size, their color patterns, their song, their habitat preferences, and their genetics. Um, basically, our, our decim species tend to be more upland species. Our Cassini species tend to be in floodplains or lower. And we also find the Decula species uh, tend to be more of upland species as well. Now, there are more than 3,000 species of cicadas worldwide, but the only place on planet Earth that we have 13 and 17 year cicadas is right here in the eastern half of the United States. They again emerge in these enormous numbers in very well-defined areas. We'll talk about that in just a minute. Uh, and these different groups that emerge are called broods. So let's talk about what a brood is. A brood is simply a massive emergence of periodical cicadas in rather well-defined geographic locations. We have 15 broods of periodical cicadas. There are 12 broods of 17-year cicadas and three broods of 13-year cicadas, giving us the 15. Um, unfortunately, during recorded history, we know that brood 11, which used to be found up here in Connecticut, has gone extinct. And brood 21, that used to be in northern Florida, also has gone extinct in recorded history. The early cicada researchers designated the different broods with Roman numerals. So the brood 10 cicada that's appearing right now uh, is also fondly known as brood X, which makes it ever much more kind of scary and creepy, right? Brood X, that's more interesting than brood 10, like X marks the spot. So here in the Northeast region is a real hotbed. Uh, brood X is found, it's the largest distributors, most widely distributed brood of 17 year cicadas found in 15 states, ranging from Georgia to Long Island and west to Indiana and Illinois. So this is the most widespread brood of 17 year cicadas. Now, as I said before, we have 15 extant broods. Uh, you can go see these maps and uh, at various websites and see where the different broods occur. That's always kind of fun to do. In terms of their evolutionary history, we know the ancestors of periodical cicadas uh, date back at least 4 million years. An important event happened at about 3.9 million years ago when the progeners for the uh, extant broods we have today split into two large groups, the Cassini and Decula groups going this way, the Decim groups going this way. At 2.5 million years ago, Cassini's and Decula split, but it's only been within the past 500,000 years, very recently, that we've had the diversification and radiation into the 15 extant broods that we see today. 
Much of this took place during periods of glaciation here in North America. And we really don't know uh, what the genetic mechanism, the regulatory mechanism was or is uh, that created these 15 broods. We have some hypotheses, which we'll talk about in just a minute. Now, several years ago, I'm sure some of you follow my Bug of the Week blog, and you know I got very excited back in 2017 and in 2020 when we had an unusual emergence of brood 10 cicadas. Brood cicadas that emerge off cycle. In other words, there's usually a massive emergence synchronously, but oftentimes these cicadas are time travelers. And sometimes they will make a jump either four years early or four years late, one year early or one year late. And in 2017, we had a fairly impressive emergence of brood 10 cicadas in 2017 throughout the DMV. These early risers or late risers are called stragglers. Now, we also had uh, a similar acceleration in 2020 when we saw brood 10 cicadas as well. We think it's this time travel, the time jump that cicadas make that have, that have created the 15 broods. So here's one hypothesis about how this might happen. So for example, if we had a brood 14 cicada and they made the four-year time jump, they would become brood 10. Brood 10 makes a four-year time jump, it becomes brood six. Brood six makes a four-year time jump, it's brood two. And then if brood two jumps one year either way, it becomes brood one or brood three. So this is how we believe that we now have these 15 broods of periodical cicadas, this strange evolutionary behavior they have to jump time, usually in four-year intervals or sometimes one-year intervals. I wanna spend some time now talking about synchrony, the long life cycle and prime numbers. Again, things that seem somewhat mysterious, but hey, these, these cicadas really figured it out. Number one, in any biological sim system, you must have synchrony between males and females, right? It's gotta happen, otherwise you don't reproduce. So synchrony is a common phenomenon in all living things bringing males and females together at the same point in time. Now, for predator satiation to work, in other words, that strategy of filling the bellies of everybody that wants to eat you, you must be highly synchronized because if you emerge one year early, the predators will eat you into oblivion one year late, you're headed for oblivion again, so synchrony is critically important for their strange strategy for survival. The other important part of this is the long life cycle, okay? The long life cycle. Number one, they feed on xylem, which is nutrient poor. It's not like leaves, it's not like phloem. It tends to have low nutrient content. So maybe it simply takes them longer to get enough nutrition to grow to the size they need to. Another uh, possibility, of course, is they live in a chilly habitat. Underground is, is basically, you know, 50 degrees. And as you know, insect development is directly related to temperature. So perhaps because they're in a chilly environment, they simply grow more slowly. Another possibility, of course, is that size matters. Remember, to achieve this goal of predator satiation, what do you have to do? You have to lay a lot of eggs, right? You have to have a lot of progeny. How do you do that? Well, you get large. In insects, fecundity, in other words, the number of babies you have is often related to your body size. How do you get big? Well, it may take simply longer for you to grow to get big enough to have that giant mass of eggs you need to have. Finally, we think that there's one hypothesis that during their ice age evolution as glaciers moved up and down the Appalachian Mountains, that random and stochastic events like very late freezes, let's say, that might extirpate, eliminate a population. If you extend your life cycle very long, the probability that a random event uh, extirpates you 
decreases. Another hypothesis. But here's my favorite, that you simply outlive your predators. So let's talk about how that might work. I'm going to take you back now to your freshman biology or ecology course where you learned about predator prey cycles. Remember, the prey population goes up, then the predator population goes up, then the prey decline and the predators decline. Then the prey population goes up and the predator population goes up. And then the predators eat them down and then the predators decline. And then the prey population goes up and the predator population goes up. Predator prey cycles. Now let's think about who the predators of periodical cicadas are. Raccoons, foxes, squirrels, sparrows, woodpeckers, blue jays. Do any of those creatures live 17 years? I don't think so. So a very long life cycle makes it impossible for any predator to depend on you and track you through time. You simply live so long, all your predators, they, they can't depend on you. They give up and say, well, you know, they're not here this year, so we can't really depend on them. They basically outlive the predators in time that are able, that might be able to track their population. Of course, we have other cicadas like our annual cicadas that appear every year. And yes, indeed, they do have predators that track them through time. Some of you are familiar with the cicada killer wasp, right? The thing that builds the hole in your lawn and catches cicadas and stuffs them down the hole. They can depend on our annual cicadas. They specialize on those because they appear every year. So proof of concept. I want to talk now about prime numbers. This is a little bit mysterious, so I'll try to work you through it. One of the uh, ways to approach the prime number phenomenon is to simply model this. Uh, again, we're very fond in ecology and biology of making mathematical models. So the modelers created a system where we had interacting predators and prey, uh, a hypothetical predator and the cicada. We have random mutations in the prey incubation time. In other words, how long the cicadas are underground and how long it takes the predators to starve to death, the starvation time. When they run these models, 20,000 generations, what they find is the predators are basically going to tank after nine years. However, the prey will hang in there in prime numbered years of 13, 17, 19, and 11. And this is exactly what we see, 13 and 17, for the periodical cicadas. Perhaps a little bit easier way to understand this has to do with pro this prime number, long life cycle, and what happens if you interbreed. So let's imagine now that in one geographic location, we have periodical cicadas that emerge every two years and another kind of cicada that emerges every four years. That means every two years, they are interbreeding, correct? They're both emerging every two years, right? The two year after two years, uh, is going to emerge with a four year and this guy is going to happen with some frequency. So if this is happening and we have interbreeding and hybrids, we're likely to have cicadas that emerge in one year, two years, three years, and four years. Hybrids, just like us, hybrids. What does that mean for predator satiation? What it means is this because you now have spread out the emergence in year one, two, three, and four, as Fauci says, you have flattened the curve because it's no longer synchronous. You have flattened the curve. This allows your predators to eat you into extinction. So synchronous prime numbers, that's the way to pull this thing off, preventing hybridization. Now, in some places, we will find 13 and 17 year cicadas emerging at the same point in time, but it only happens once every 13 times 17 or 221 years. And I guarantee you there's no predator that lives 221 years. So 
This strange strategy of prime numbers and a long lifetime have certainly proven to be a winner for periodical cicadas. Another question I'm often asked is how do they know? How do they keep track of time? Well, there's a couple hypotheses. Remember I said that they feed on the xylem fluid, right? In the winter time, there are no leaves on the trees. There's no photosynthesis. So xylem flow basically becomes zero. There's no xylem going up. There's no fluid feeding the canopy, no water, no CO2 plus H2O, right? No photosynthesis. However, in the springtime when plants break bud, wow, now we get xylem tissue pulling up to the top of the tree, carrying minerals, nutrients, and water. One theory has it that the cicadas simply keep track of these fluxes in xylem flow, perhaps nutrients or plant hormones that are being transported from the roots to the canopy, and they're simply counting. One, two, three, dot, 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 15, 16, 17. It's absolutely possible. Another hypothesis simply is that they have a molecular clock in their tiny brains that is keeping track of time, ticking off the 13 or 17 years, much the same way we have circadian and monthly uh, cycles. I know I wake up at 5.30 every morning. It doesn't matter when that alarm clock is set. That's my circadian rhythm. No reason to believe that periodical cicadas can't have circadian rhythms too. So that's how they count. We think they count the 13 and 17 years. Well, when I first put this talk together, uh, Paula and I back in January, uh, we were talking about when they would emerge and we've all seen when they will emerge. So let's just briefly go over this, but basically, Back in March and April, we began to see the dime-sized holes in the ground underneath trees. So when you move the leaves aside, they were already busily building their escape routes from the roots of trees underground, right? We all saw those holes in the ground. And they do this well in advance of their emergence. We also saw mud turrets. If you went out into the garden and lifted up your stepping stones or flagstones, you saw the little cicadas as they tried to work their way up and then out past the stepping stone. Okay, they'd been waiting underground in March and April, getting ready for the next event. And the next event was when soil temperatures reach roughly 64 degrees Fahrenheit. Now, what that means is the earth is now warm enough for the periodical cicadas to get up out of the ground, to be able to climb up trees, shed their skins, avoid their predators, escape, climb to the treetops for the males, crank up the big boy band, woo the females, mate, reproduce. So that temperature of 64 is critical. The density of the cicadas, as I said, can be phenomenal. This is in my backyard. This is one square foot. There are 30 holes per square foot. That's 1.3 million cicadas per acre. That's why people say, how many cicadas will there be this year? I say, well, some people say billions. I'm saying in 15 states from Georgia to New York to the almost the Mississippi River, it's probably trillions, a lot of cicadas. So many of you, I'm sure, had the opportunity to go out at nighttime and witness the emergence of cicadas from the holes in the ground. You also saw this in the daytime, probably. Uh, once the emergence is underway, they will emerge both at nighttime uh, to avoid their predators, but as this moves along, they will also uh, continue to do this during the daytime. And if you listen very carefully, you can actually learn that they do enjoy classical music, particularly Beethoven. So if you want to have lots of cicadas emerging, I recommend Beethoven. That seems to draw them out of the ground. This is a time of great peril for the periodical cicadas because they are essentially defenseless. They have to cross sidewalks. They have to cross roadways. They're going to be attacked by all manner of predators over the next several days. They will work their way across lawns, across 
impervious surfaces, they're going to seek um, they're going to seek vertical structures. These vertical structures in nature are usually trees, but it could be the side of a house. It could be your car's tire. And I'm sure if any of you went out at nighttime and stood in a cicada emergence, you would find that the cicada nymphs will climb up you. Uh, I've been working with, uh, as you might guess, several film crews, Paulette and I, over the past uh, eight weeks. And, uh, you know, it's, it's not at all unusual to go out at nighttime and say, oh boy, you've got a dozen cicadas crawling up you. So once they've accomplished this, once they've gotten to the tree, the next step for them is to molt or shed their skin. And oh yeah, there's lots of cicadas, bucket loads, right? I'm sure a lot of you, you folks had witnessed this this spring. One of the most fascinating parts of course is, is of course is shedding the nymphal skin. And uh, this is a time-lapse video by uh, Robert Clips. This is a nice uh, encapsulation of what the molting looks like. So we'll watch this happen. This takes place in the span of about an hour and a half, usually about 90 minutes from the time it first attaches to the tree before the adult cicada emerges. They bend over backwards like this, then they're going to pull their abdomen out and they're gonna pump hemolymph, their blood into the wings, thereby expanding the wings. Now. In my opinion, this is perhaps the most beautiful stage of the periodical cicada. I call them ghosts because they've got this eerie whitish color, the bright red eyes, and the two black patches uh, just behind their head. Those are the pigments that eventually will be transferred throughout their body to form the dark coloration of the adult cicada. So usually by morning, you will see adult cicadas that have emerged the night before with the bright red eyes, jet black body, and orange wing veins. Now it takes about four to six days for their exoskeleton to harden completely to the point where they can sing, where they can fly, where they can mate, where they can feed. The adults are going to live from two to four weeks and they also feed on xylem tissue. Uh, some of you may, my followers of Bug of the Week, uh, probably um, read my post this week. I think it's something like, uh, oh, I don't know what it is. It's uh, Fly Feed P, where you actually can watch a cicada. It's not really P. P is you, uh, mammalian urine, as you know. That's our uh, waste product for nitrogenous waste and other waste from our body. They don't really pee, but they do excrete a liquid, uh, a liquid waste product uh, that has now become termed as pee. You can see one little droplet here. And again, if you go to Bug of the Week and look at the current uh, episode, you'll see actually how they can squirt the pee or their liquid waste out their abdomen. So then it's off to the treetops. And in the treetops, uh, that's where the romance is gonna take place. And that's what's happening virtually now throughout our region in uh, the treetops all over the DMV. Now, uh, another question I get is, uh, are there blue-eyed cicadas? The answer is yes. And I'm often asked, is there a reward for finding a blue-eyed cicada? I've had three people send me pictures of blue-eyed cicadas. Uh, I've seen a couple this year myself and say, well, is there a reward for finding a blue-eyed cicada? And the answer is yes, there is a reward. The reward is that you found a blue-eyed cicada. So that's a good reward in my book. Uh, there were purported to be one in a million. I don't know, I don't think I look at a million, but I do see a couple blue-eyed ones every year. So keep an eye out for the blue-eyed cicada. Now let's talk about how they make their sounds, okay? Uh, the, it's only the male cicada that sings. He's got an organ on the side of his body. It is called the timbal organ. And I'll see if I can make the sound as loud as possible so you can hear this.
The timbal organ is like a drum head. There are muscles attached to the timbal organ. It can vibrate. That call that we just heard is called the alarm call. So if a bird attacks a cicada or a bug geek grabs a cicada, or if you grab a cicada, it will make a squawking sound. That's basically a defense trying to get away from the predator. The abdomen of the periodical cicada is hollow and it acts as an amplification chamber to basically increase the volume of that sound. Once the cicadas are in the treetop chorusing, the sound levels can reach anywhere from about 80 to 105 decibels. That's the sound of a jet aircraft or a lawnmower engine. So they're very, very loud in the treetops. I'm sure you've heard this uh, if you've been in an area where cicadas are this year. So they can be incredibly noisy. So what is this all about? Well, it's all about three things. I've already talked about the alarm call. Now remember, there are three species emerging simultaneously. So the first step is to get every member of the same species together in the same place. So when you listen to the cicada songs outside, you will hear these different sounds. Those are what we call the calling songs or chorusing songs. That brings members of the same species together in the same place for the purpose of mating. Now it's all about romance. And remember, gang, these are just teenagers. They've been living a COVID-like existence underground, social distancing, in the dark. It's spring in the 17th year. They're throwing off their subterranean masks, getting up into the treetops. And what do teenagers do? It's going to be music and romance. So that's what it's all about right now in the treetops. Once the cicadas get eyeball to eyeball, then the male cicada will switch over to his courtship songs. He has a variety of courtship songs that he will use to try to convince that special someone that she should be the mother of his nymphs. If he sings loud, and we believe that loud is very important, I guess uh, it's important in humans, but apparently it's also important in cicadas, that the ones that sing the loudest are probably the ones most likely to be successful with the women. And ladies, we all know it's always women that get to choose. So his performance better be good. If she likes his performance, she will flick her wings, make a little clicking noise, and that will signal, signal his, her willingness to mate with him. They're going to then hook up and mate. So we've seen cicadas. Uh, Patricia was telling me a little bit uh, about this earlier tonight uh, in our pre-meeting conference. So don't be surprised if you see cicadas. And of course, uh, we have to change up the music a little bit for this, don't we, gang? Yeah, OK. It's not Beethoven anymore. We can tell the males from the females if you want to go out. This will be another part of your homework assignment. The males will have kind of a roundish abdomen with a little knob on the end. The females will have a very sharp pointy thing on the end. That is the ovipositor. That's what she will use to cut the slits in the branches and lay her eggs. Right now, what's underway throughout the region, I know in my yard, in my neighborhood, the females are laying their eggs. Here is a female ovipositing in a small branch. They're going to choose branches usually about 3 to 11 millimeters in length. She will use her ovipositor to cut slits into these branches. These are called egg nests. She will then pump eggs through her ovipositor. You can see her abdomen pulsing here into the egg nest. She'll lay 20 to 30 eggs per egg nest and she can lay between 400 and 600 eggs during the course of her lifetime. This is why we have phenomenal numbers of periodical cicadas. The eggs are going to mature in about six to 10 weeks. So sometime in July or even August, those eggs will hatch. Then the tiny cicada nymphs will drop 80 feet to the soil below. They will burrow in 
they will find roots to feed on and again return underground for another 17 years. They'll basically molt four times. They, they have five instars, the first instar nymph, second instar nymph, third instar nymph, fourth instar nymph, fifth instar nymph. It's the fifth instar nymph that's the one that comes out of the ground. A lot of times if you're working in your garden over the next 17 years, you'll dig up some earth and you'll find periodical cicada nymphs down in the soil. This may be something you've seen yourself. So basically, again, a little review here. We're gonna see animals. And I know in my yard, I had the fox beginning back in March. Uh, it excavated a 30 foot trench on the side of my house, digging up cicada nymphs. I had reports of raccoons and dogs doing the same thing. Usually in March and April, we start to see the chimneys or the holes appearing. The nymphs are going to emerge in, again, usually we saw the first nymph out of the ground anywhere in the United States, April 19th, just out of sight of Towson, Maryland. And that continued on and is peaking right now. The singing has begun. You've all heard the choruses, I'm sure. The mating, the egg laying, the predators uh, have been gobbling these things up. Uh, everything on the planet has wanted to eat a cicada. cicada. And now the next step, unfortunately, we're going to begin to see the damage cicadas are causing to trees. That'll be my next episode of Bug of the Week, which will air um, a week from yesterday. Okay, eggs are then going to hatch in July and August. Now, yeah, everything on the planet wants to eat cicadas. As I said, I've seen squirrels, raccoons, foxes digging holes in the ground. Birds love these things. Reptiles will eat them. Squirrels will eat them. People will eat them. No doubt about it. Uh, as I said, uh, I was watching... Uh, <laughs> sparrows gobbling these things up uh, on the ground the other day. Uh, in my neighborhood, there's a beautiful pair of red shoulders hawks nesting. They've got three chicks in that nest and they've been feeding them uh, cicadas nonstop every day. I've seen pileated woodpeckers, all kinds of creatures eating these. There are many invertebrates that will eat them as well. Uh, during the night of emergence, carpenter ants will harvest these things from the trees and feed, feed relentlessly on them. But perhaps the most bizarre and spectacular of all of their enemies is the fungus known as Massospora. So I mentioned that there was no predator that could wait 17 or 13 years, right? Well, there is no predator that can do this, but there is a pathogen that can do this. It is Massospora psychedini. When you go outside, you will see cicadas with half of their abdomen missing and the other half of the abdomen turned into a fungal fruiting body. This is Massospora. Massospora fungus waits as a spore on the surface of the earth for 17 years. When the cicada nymph emerges from the ground, the spores adhere to its body, they germinate, they invade its body, turning it into a fungus garden. Now, this does not affect the libido of periodical cicadas. Their minds are still intact, they still are driven to mate. What will happen is the male periodical cicada that's infected, like this one, we'll get him going, will continue to seek mates and he will mate or attempt to mate, even though he's sterile, he will attempt to mate with females, thereby transmitting the fungus to the female. And at this point in time, massospora becomes an STD and spreads through the cicada population. The same thing will be true for females that are infected. They will attract males who will attempt to mate and become infected themselves. Now, this is the most bizarre part of the story. The massospora fungus produces psychoactive compounds that take control of the cicada's tiny mind. Remember I said the female to signify her willingness to mate would flicker wings? What massospora does is it makes a male cicada flick his wings. Other males think it's a female they attempt to mate with the infected male, thereby spreading the massospora fungus 
throughout the cicada population. Pretty crazy stuff, huh? You can't make this stuff up, but that's what they do. So look for massive spore fungus out there. The final act of contrition, of course, is death. And this is now underway. I'm beginning to see large numbers of cicadas underneath my trees uh, all throughout the region now. As we cross the peak, as cicadas have laid their eggs, what we'll see is beneath the trees, uh, the, the, the cicadas will be dying in large numbers. There's a number of recyclers. Ants, for example, will recycle the cicadas once they get to the ground. Fly maggots, carrion flies, things like this, or carrion beetles will now feed on periodical cicada carcasses. So after the 17 years, remember, for 17 years, they took from the tree by feeding on the sap. In the 17th year, they come up, they feed every predator that wants to eat them, and finally, when they're done, they rain down on the very plants for which they were spawned and return nutrients to those soils, the circle of life. The other interesting thing, of course, is the holes. They're escape galleries. These things go down 12 inches into the earth. There can be as many as 30 per square foot. This is like having a super soil aeration system in your lawns and under your trees. And those holes are going to persist for more than one year, allowing water to infiltrate the earth and basically feed, be available for the roots of, of trees and shrubs and plants in your yard. So one more benefit of the periodical cicada. Will they damage herbaceous plants? They're not going to feed on herbaceous plants per se, and the feeding damage of periodical cicadas is minimal, however, when you have vast numbers of these emerging on your herbaceous plants, they will weigh them down. We'll see terminals that get bent over and may die because they simply have had hundreds, if not thousands of cicadas on them. So we have seen a little bit of this type of damage on herbaceous plants. Most of the egg laying takes place, of course, in woody plants, trees, and shrubs. And this is the dark side of cicadas. When you have vast numbers of cicadas, you will simply see scores, if not hundreds of these egg nests lining the branches. This will cause what we call flagging. So you'll see trees where the foliage is brown and the kind of tree they are gonna favor are vigorous, young, rapidly growing trees. That is the description of a sapling. We know that mature and well-established trees will shrug this off. They will be no long-term reduction in either survival or radial incremental growth of those trees. This has been demonstrated over and over again in scientific studies. However, on young trees, this is going to be a problem, okay? Uh, I had one nursery grower who related this story to me in 2003. He planted a large number of trees in his nursery. He said in 2004, the cicadas came along and they simply wiped out the young trees that he had planted by laying eggs in them. They've got a huge number of trees. More than 200 species are used to, uh, for egg laying. So uh, they're, they're basically going to go over after most trees. Not so much are gymnosperms, um, again, tight branches, uh, things like, um, of course, spruces and firs and things like that are not going to receive the same kind of injury as these rapidly growing young trees are. So again, this, no problem. This is a problem. Notice how the tree with the open branches rapidly growing, all the branches just the right size is heavily attacked, but this one right behind it, these two, there's a locust here and a cherry, I think. Not so much. This is the tree that Cicada loves. You might have heard they could rack sticky bands to prevent this. And that's not going to work. Why? Because the cicadas that emerge are all going to fly up to a chorus in another tree. And when they've made it, they're going to fly back to other trees to lay eggs. So banding, no effect. The worst thing you can do is apply pesticides. 
Here are three studies, one done by myself, one done by Henry Hogmeyer, another by uh, Daniel Frank. We've learned that if you wrap your trees with netting of one centimeter mesh size or smaller, it will almost totally prevent cicada damage. If the mesh gets too big, 2.5 or five centimeters, the cicadas will get through. If you spray trees repeatedly with organophosphates and synthetic pyrethroids, potent pesticides, you can't stop the cicadas. You might kill what's there today, but tomorrow there are gonna be 10 more and 20 more and so on. That's exactly what they did. They couldn't stop the damage. And think about this harm it causes to your beneficial insects, your bees, your pollinators, the other animals that live in your landscape. So we're saying don't spray cicadas. We did the same thing. Uh, Daniel Frank repeated this experiment with neem oil. These are organic kale and clay. Simply didn't work nearly as well as wrapping those trees in exclusion fabric. Same thing with me. Netted trees, this is a neonicotinoid insecticide. That didn't keep them off. Net your trees. So this is what we've recommended. Now, frankly, gang, it's a little bit too late. Uh, we started to put this information out back in January and February. I think a lot of people bought in. I see a lot of tents up this year, which is great, but uh, you're, there may be some benefit, but cicadas are already laying eggs. I'm not saying don't, but um, it's, it's getting pretty late for doing this. This is how we did it in my experiments. People say, well, other creatures are going to get caught in this, snakes and birds. Well, if there are birds nesting in the trees, of course, don't net them. But I had 30 netted trees. There was never a reptile that got caught in this. There was no bird that got caught in this. So I think if you do it well, you're not gonna have to worry too much about other creatures getting uh, caught. If there is damage to your uh, young branches, uh, the branches of your young tree, simply prune it out. Uh, again, always go back to the last uh, node that where the axillary buds are going to take over and produce new wood. So don't just prune it in the middle of a branch, go back to the node where other branches come off and that's where you make your pruning cut. Okay, so this is what we're recommending people do. This is a good way to keep those cicadas out. What else can you do? Well, uh, pets are gonna love these things. Don't let your pets eat too many. I've had reports of uh, golden retrievers eating bucket loads of this and having a little bit of digestive discomfort on either end, so be careful with that. Uh, filter, pool filters may need to be clean. Some people will actually put cicadas in their pool, which is kind of cool. For us, it's a wonderful teaching and learning opportunity. It's like having a National Geographic special in your own backyard. You can use this as a fantastic opportunity to engage children of all ages in cicadas. And I think this year, uh, the print and non-print media broadcast has done a spectacular job trying to help people understand uh, cicadas and really get on board. Um, it presented interesting opportunities for me to interact with guys like Jay Leno. I was climbing around with a crew from uh, the Today Show and somehow Jay Leno's producer saw the outtakes and they said, well, how would you like to come to California and see if Jay Leno would like to eat cicadas? And I said, well, how could I resist? And so I smuggled you know, a couple dozen out on Southwest in my carry-on and the producer said, look, uh, we'll fix them. I had them roasted and they were kind of like on a little skewer. We had six cicadas lined up. And she said, you know, offer one to Jay, eat one yourself if you want. We don't know what he'll do. And then offer one to the other guest. The other guest that night happened to be Russell Crowe, who had just finished uh, the Superman movie where he plays Jarrell, Superman's father. So, I, the first part of the thing, I did the scientist like I'm doing with you, and I talked all about cicadas. And then finally, Jay says, he says, well, Professor Ralph, does anything eat a cicada? And I said, well, Jay, look at this. And I took one, I popped it in my mouth. I said, mm, boy, that's really good. You know, it's got a nutty flavor. It's a little crunchy. That nutty flavor is probably from the tannins on the tree roots they fed on for 17 years. And then I kind of turned to, to Leno to ask if he wanted a cicada. And Russell Crowe is now sitting behind me and he whispers off, off 
air basically says, I'm not going to eat that meat. So I pointed the thing at Jay Leno. I said, Jay, I'll give you a dollar if you eat a cicada. So he took one, he popped it in his mouth. He said, mm, these are better than Cheetos. And then he took it and he pointed it at, at Russell Crowe. And he said, Superman's father, like that. And Russell Crowe said, no thanks, mate. There are no cicadas on Krypton. So we know they're better than Cheetos and there are none on Krypton, but there are lots here on planet Earth, so go have fun. Now, for people that fear cicadas, I get it. Uh, these things are loud, there's lots of them. They can be kind of creepy and freaky. There are three pieces of advice that I've been giving for the last six months. Number one, Try to learn as much about them as you possibly can. Understand they're not going to bite. They're not going to sting. They're not going to carry away dogs and small children like the monkeys in the Wizard of Oz. That's not happening. All right, they're kind of bumly. They're the Laurel and Hardy of the bug world. They're going to fly and land on your shoulders, and you can pick them off and say you're confused. If you throw them up in the air, they're going to be on their way. They're not going to harm you. Number two, if you find this disagreeable or hard to cope with, I, I think you should seek some professional help, a social worker, a clergy person, a trusted friend. Talk to somebody about your concerns and fear, help to find ways that you can cope with this. And finally, if it's simply too much, just get out of town. No cicadas in Ocean City, no cicadas in Bethesda, no cicadas in the Poconos, upstate New York, Florida, or California, take a cicada break. I had a friend who said, Mike, let me know when they're coming out. Two weeks ago, I said, they're here. And he said, great, I got my tickets. I'm going to Boise, Idaho. I'll see you in three weeks. So get out of town, cicada vacation. Now, if you're still interested in learning more, uh, hopefully some of you participated in this fantastic citizen science project called Cicada Safari, developed by my colleague, Gene Kritsky, out at Mount St. Joseph's University in Cincinnati. We've had a wealth of data pour in. I'm using this data to analyze the emergence curves of cicadas, trying to find their geographic distribution. We still don't know exactly where cicadas are, but to date, I think we there's some 170,000 records that have been collected already. So we're going to have a much better feel once we sort through the data about what's going on. Uh, again, our graduate students, uh, Paula and I have been teaching a graduate level course in scientific outreach. It's called the Cicada Crew. Some of you may have visited our website. Uh, again, it's just Cicada Crew UMD. It has videos, it's got resources, uh, a lot of good information, Cicada Mania, another great website, uh, a research website, Yukon Cicada, Yukon site, and of course the Audubon Naturalist in collaboration with GW University, put friend to Cicada up, great resources for school uh, kids. And my own blog, Bug of the Week, uh, there are 12 episodes in there now about cicadas, and I'll probably want to run one or two more before we're all done. So with that, DC Master Gardeners, thank you very much for inviting me into your homes this evening to share some bug stories with you. Uh, Patricia, if we have time and energy, I'd be more than happy to answer a few questions or as many questions as you like. Um, I'm, I mean, it's already seven, but if we could go through maybe just two or three, would that be okay? It's perfectly fine with me. Okay, well, I'll read some out for you then. Okay. Uh, this one's from Jan. There seems to be huge area, uh, areas of huge numbers, and then the next block zero. Is that a matter of disturbed areas not having cicadas? Probably not. They're very patchy, and what it has to do is where the eggs were laid 17 years ago, where they set up their choruses, and then where they move to lay their eggs this year. So for example, your neighbor may have had a lot of cicadas come out. My neighbor did, not so much in my yard, but now all the cicadas that came out of her tree are laying eggs on my tree. So in 2038, I'm going to have a lot of cicadas, but in 2038, that oak tree in her yard is going to be gone. So they will be very patchy over very short differences depending where the eggs were laid. Now, when we have vast areas without cicadas, 
That very likely is due to the heavy deforestation that happened during our colonial period when we chopped down all the trees on the East Coast and we turned it into tobacco fields and corn fields. So again, there are historical links and yes, part of that could be due to maybe a half a mile away, it was a pasture or something else uh, 300 years ago. Good question. Well, thank you. Um, there's um, one from Margaret Walsh. Has global warming caused any changes in behavior or habits of cicadas? Yes, what we do know is that with climate change, again, as I said uh, earlier, uh, you know, a mere 20,000 years ago, there was a glacier sitting in the middle of Pennsylvania. Obviously, there were no cicadas there. But as that glacier receded, we now have cicadas in the middle of New York State and Pennsylvania. So we know they will move further north. We expect many plants and animals as the climate warms to simply continue to move to higher altitudes and latitudes. So someday Canada may have cicadas. Number two, my colleagues have believed they've seen an advancement of perhaps as much as two weeks of cicadas emerging rather than the first part of May the middle of April in places in Ohio because the ground is simply warmer now, they're up and out earlier now. Number three, others of my colleagues believe that the cicadas that emerge in 17 years because of warmer temperatures may now shift to a 13 year life cycle and become 13 year cicadas rather than 17 year cicadas. So yes, like all things on the planet, we expect major changes in cicadas related to climate change and global warming. Great, thank you. Last one, very quick. Um, do the females mate with various males? Various males, no, that's, a, that's an interesting question. This is a question Diane Sawyer once asked me, if anybody remembers who Diane Sawyer was, but basically these are primitive insects. Um, what the male does is after he mates with the female, he inserts what we call the copulatory plug. This is the equivalent of a chastity belt for a cicada. It prevents her from mating again, ensuring that it's his sperm that will be used to fertilize the egg. So she only gets to mate once as far as we know. How unfair is this? He will then run off and mate with other females, as many as he can find. So. It's an unfair primitive world of the cicada. <laughs> Thank you so much, Mike. This was wonderful. A lot of people commenting. Thank you very, thank you for the, the great presentation. My pleasure. Good luck. Uh, try to go out and enjoy this. It only happens a handful of times in a lifetime. It's uh, one of nature's most spectacular and bizarre events. So I hope you enjoy the cicadas uh, as much as I do. And uh, Take care, enjoy, enjoy a nice summer Master Gardeners and good luck to you in your Master Gardener training. Thanks, Mike. Thanks everybody. Good night. Thank you so much for joining. Thank you.